celebrations, troubles, and share them with one another, and then lift those things up together to God. So if you have any of those things, anything on your heart, big or small, I invite you to share that now. No one's life is without stress. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I just ask for prayers for Pastor Bill, who's got a little Montezuma's revenge from our trip to Mexico. <laughs>
parents and the youth who are participating and all the support we've had as we as we grow this ministry. It's a good thing. And we do have to be, but particularly for my thesis, we have suffered uh, quite a lot of setback. Um, after the state retreat, um, I was talking to a friend of mine, and um, she's not a Christian, and I was able to bring up the J word and talked about God and Jesus a little bit, and it was just, it was a really nice, no pressure conversation, and so just thank you for that going much better than you think it should go when you think about talking to someone about Jesus and for um, giving me enough Holy Spirit that day to properly articulate things and just prayers for her and that she may be as accepted in the future. Um, Sarah definitely is so I'm great for Sarah no matter. <laughs> She's been <laughs> battling this all week. And um, Second, I'm preaching at uh, my other church this Sunday, and I am at once exhilarated and terrified. So, <laughs> um, so I just want it to go well, and that um, that people can hear the Holy Spirit, and that I just really fully surrender to um, what God needs me to say. So. Huh. Uh, the girl who disappeared two weeks ago came back home. Uh, She's not saying where she went or why. She cut her hair off completely, but at least she's safe. So. <coughs> Drum and prayer. Dear Lord, we come to you with open hearts. We're so thankful you have given us the strength to be able to know that when we do, we lift these things up to you, that they are heard, and that you take them into the account of your plan. We thank you for new opportunities, new jobs, new discussions, new just openings in our lives. And we ask that you give us confidence to push forward with these new opportunities and to complete them the way you would want us to, so that we can grow closer to you through our actions. We ask that you look after those who are sick, whether it's something they've been dealing with for a while or something that has come out of the blue, that you are with them and with their families so that they know you are there in that place and that you want to know that you are looking after those people and they can have peace. We ask that you look over each one of us as we deal with all of the stress that comes with being a college student, a youth group leader, a parent, a friend. Stress can push us away from you, so we ask that you give us that, remind us to always turn to you when we have dealing with stress so that we don't fall further away from you. Thank you for birthdays, for life, for friendships, new and old for just opportunities to have fun and fellowship. And we ask that you keep giving us those opportunities as we move forward. We ask for your blessing on the bone marrow drive that's happening tomorrow. May you move in the hearts of the people here in East Lansing and help them to realize how quick and easy it would be to just go and sign up and to be that life-saving donor for someone else. And you would move in their hearts if they would want to do that. We ask that you look after each one of us as we leave this place so that we can take what you have said and incorporate it into our lives the way you would want us to. And we ask that you keep us safe throughout the week so that we can return together next week stronger, more close and closer to you and each other ready again to hear your word. We ask all of these things in your name. Pray together as your son taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, and we forgive those who trespass against us. And give us not temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
tell the woman about your back. Today's scripture apparently comes from Luke chapter 2, verses 41 through 52, because I'm negligent, don't open my email. <laughs> now every year his parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up as usual for the festival. When the festival was ended and they started to return, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but his parents did not know it. Assuming that he was in the group of travelers, they went a day's journey. Then they started to look for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem to search for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Child, why have you treated us like this? Look, your father and I have been searching for you in great anxiety. He said to them, Why were you searching for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he said to them. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. His mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in years and in divine and human the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. God. Jesus and his 
family are going to Jerusalem for the Passover. If you remember, the Passover celebrated God delivering um, the people from slavery from Egypt. And it's one of the three sort of important festivals that people would travel to Jerusalem for. Um, it was the Passover of Pentecost and Tabernacles. And the Passover was like the biggie. It was like Christmas. It was, if there was one that people could make, it would be the Passover. Um, a lot of people lived too far away to be able to make it to all these festivals. And a lot of people were just too poor to be able to travel to Jerusalem for all these festivals. And the men actually were required to go to the festival, um, but the women and children not so much. But we often find that whole families would travel um, for these occasions. If you think about um, the Holy Family, they live in Nazareth in the northern part of Galilee. It was about um, a five-day travel from um, Nazareth to Jerusalem. And so if you imagine they traveling five days down, three days for the festival, and five days back up for, for two weeks for this um, encounter. And so that was a long time to be away from your wife and children. So often the whole family would go, and they would travel in these large groups with other family members and other people from the village. And Nazareth was uh, just a small village, maybe 100 people. And so you can imagine the whole village sort of gathering together and traveling down to Jerusalem with one another. Um, and it was very dangerous um, to travel in that time. So it was important to travel in large groups because there were lots of thieves and robbers on the way who were out to get people who were traveling alone. Well, we're told that they travel and it's the, the 12th, Jesus' 12th birthday would have been his 12th Passover, that the Holy Family went every year religiously to this Passover. And if you know anything about the Jewish faith, on the 13th year, um, Jewish boys would have their mitzvah. And it would be this opportunity for them to become men, to really um, take possession of their faith and to own it for themselves. And so Jesus is a year from that time when he really is considered an adult in the faith for the first time. And so as he's entering, he's entering going with his family for the last time as a child, knowing that next year when he goes, he will be considered an adult, and he would, he would be expected to go to this festival and participate and be a part of it for the first time. Well, after the Passover, Mary and Joseph begin their journey back to Nazareth, and they get a day into their journey, and you imagine they stop and they set up camp with all these other family members, and suddenly they cannot find their son Jesus looking all over for him, asking all the other family members, have you seen Jesus? And they realize he's just not with them. Now, that would make many scholars, and many have, say, what irresponsible parents these holy family parents were, Mary and Joseph, how did they lose their kid? Well, I can tell you, as a parent, it's not that difficult to lose your kid. <laughs> I lost Sephora on occasion, and one time I lost her in the house. And I was frantically searching every room of the house for Sephora. And I'm yelling her name, and I checked every room. I couldn't find her. I checked every room again. I'm looking in closets, and I'm thinking, is she playing hide-and-go-seek? But I can't find her anywhere. And so then I think, well, maybe she left, and I just didn't hear her leave the door. And then I'm thinking, she could be anywhere. And I'm like, maybe I should call the police. I don't know what to do. I can't find her. And then I hear the garage door going up, and I think, Great, right, Bill's home, he can help me look for her. Then the panic hits, I have to admit to my husband that I've lost our child. <laughs> that doesn't make me feel much better. So I frantically start looking for her one last time before he gets in the door, and I find her, and she's not very big, and this was, she was like three at the time, and she was just tiny, and she was sleeping in her brother's bed, but the blankets were just puffed up that even though I went in there like three times, I didn't see her laying there. <laughs> <laughs> you can't even hear, I know. I didn't know then, and I was completely panicked. But if you've ever gotten together with your family or a big group, it's not that easy to sort of lose track. Everybody's keeping track of everybody else. And Jesus, as a 12-year-old, probably really was expected to help keep track of the other little kids in the village and his maybe brothers and sisters, depending on which one. <laughs> which scholars you will go agree with if he had brothers or sisters or not. Um, but, you know, he was old enough that he should just follow along and not really be kept track of. I know um, one time Pastor Bill and I went on vacation with our friends who have five kids. And so their five kids and our two kids, we had seven kids from the age of three to like eight. And we went to like Universal Studios. So imagine like seven kids. 
kids running around Universal Studios. I mean, it's like trying to count cats, you know? I mean, you get three, and then you're like, if I count the same one again, I don't know if they're all here. And so I imagine that that's how these big groups were traveling along. We just couldn't keep track of everybody. So anyway, Mary and Joseph finally determined he is not here, and so they head back to Jerusalem to look for him. And after three days of searching, they finally find him, and he's in the temple. Now, I just want to point out that Luke does some really cool stuff here. And in the beginning of his book, in the beginning in this story, and in previous stories, and at the end of Luke, they really parallel each other. And I don't know if you ever noticed this, but three days, that kind of strikes a key right there, right? So we have, just first, right off the top, the thing that you notice is, is three days. And Luke always uses this. Um, sort of analogy of being found and lost throughout his gospel. And if you're found, you're sort of, or if you're lost, you're kind of dead to the world. And if you're found, then you're alive. You found Christ when you're alive in Christ. And so we have Jesus lost for three days. He's dead, right? And then he's found by his parents and he's alive again. It's very reminiscent of the end of the story, right? He's in the tomb and he's dead for three days and then he's alive. Um, we find some other parallels too, and I just want to list them so you can hear how, how Luke parallels these stories. Um, he says to them, why were you searching for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And then we hear in the end of the story, the women are looking for Jesus, and two men appear to them, and they ask, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, but he's risen. Right? He's, why are you looking for him? He says, in my father's house. Of course, that's where he is. Um, anyway, Mary... Um, saying she remembers the things that the angel Gabriel told her. Um, and then the women at the end of the story are saying, we remember the things that Jesus told them when they, when they hear that he's found, when they hear that he's resurrected. They, they find Jesus in the temple. And, and he's listening to the teachers and he's asking them questions. And you can imagine this dialogue. Um, not like probably a lot of your professors who just stand up there and listen yeah. to you for an hour and there's no dialogue. But in that time, there was a lot of dialogue. The teachers would ask questions of the students sitting at their feet. And the questions, you know, the students would answer the questions and they would ask questions to the teacher. And the teacher would answer those questions back. And it was this wonderful dialogue. And so Jesus is sitting there at the feet. I mean, we often read that passage and think of him up as teaching, but he really probably was this pupil was listening to the teachers, and as they asked questions, he would answer these questions and come back with these really amazing questions back to the teachers. And we hear that everybody is amazed about the things that he's saying. And we'll hear later in his ministry, and also foreshadows it. There's things that he will say that everybody is amazed, the answers that he comes up with when the Pharisees and the Sadducees try to challenge him. Um, we see here Jesus, even at this young age, really exhibits that he's the Son of God. Um, before his baptism, before his ministry starts, even prior to what is considered adulthood in the Jewish faith. But of course, in the eyes of Mary and you know, of Joseph, he is a child, and he is their child who has been lost for three days. And so Mary is just filled with anger and rage when she first sees him. I can just imagine this as a parent. And she says, child, why have you treated us like this? Look, your father and I have been searching for you in great anxiety. Any parent with a lost child would understand this. But Jesus seems a bit surprised by Mary's response. That they would even be searching for him. And he said, shouldn't, shouldn't they understand where he would be? That's what he's thinking. How could you not know where I would be? Of course, I'm in my father's house. I think, as I see him in this passage, really finds himself torn. There's a human side of him that wants to uphold the commandments to honor your mother and father. But then this divine side of him knows that he has a greater calling. And that greater calling calls him to be at the foot of these scholars and these religious leaders in the temple, answering their questions and asking them questions, and even at this age of 12, challenging them. So often in our lives, I think we, we think of the challenges as being choosing right from wrong. But the reality is those will be the easiest decisions that you have to make. 
the ones that are cut and dry, and you know this is right and this is wrong, and I know the right thing to pick. But most often the questions in our lives that we'll be faced with aren't those black and white questions. They're the ones that Jesus had here, where both of the responses, both of the actions are worthy. Do I obey my parents and go back to Nazareth with them? Or do I stay at the temple and do the thing that I feel like I'm called to do there? You guys are in a position, I think, much like Jesus. You might read the story and think of him as a 12-year-old boy and much younger than where you are. But in his sits and labor, he's really in the same spot that you are. You're in that position between being a child and being an adult. And at 12 years old, in the time of Jesus, he was in the same position. Right on that edge of childhood and adult. And the struggle between what it means to obey your parents and what it means to be off on your own. And you're in that time when you're asked whether you're going to follow your parents many times or where you feel like God is calling you. And it's not a black and white answer. It's not easy. You're in the situation that Jesus is in this passage saying, what is it that God really wants me to do? Does God want me to do the thing that my parents are calling me to? Or does God want me to do something else? And how do I choose? Sometimes that call that Jesus puts on your life will be intention. Sometimes it'll be intention with your family, just like in this passage, where you're torn between really listening to God in your heart and following God and the journey that you feel God is leading you in your life. Sometimes it will affect your economic prosperity. And sometimes your family might say, what are you doing and what are you thinking? Bill and I both made that choice. I think our families still shake our heads and think, you have a PhD and you're on your way for a PhD and you have a master's and you could be making a ton of money and why are you in ministry making very little? And people around you will question why are you doing those things? Because you're listening to God in your heart and your call. Sometimes it'll affect your social acceptance probably all know that because you're all sitting here tonight and probably most of you got invited to go do something else that maybe seemed a lot cooler to your friends and they thought, why the heck would you want to go worship God tonight when we could be going out to the bar drinking instead? Or you make those decisions around your homework about going out and doing something or staying back and studying because you know that God has a plan for you and part of that plan means to take advantage of this great opportunity to get an education. By just going to college and even getting a bachelor's degree, you have more education than 90% of the people in the world. That is a gift from God. It is an opportunity that God has placed in your hands so that you might fulfill what God is calling you to do in your life and to do amazing things for God. Maybe it's instead of going someplace warm and sunny for spring break, signing up to go on a mission trip to Washington, D.C., and learning about immigration issues and the things that you can do to make a difference in the church and in the world for people who are less fortunate than you. It's not as glorious as sitting on the beach in Mexico, I can tell you, because I just got back. <laughs> but it might be where God is calling you and pulling out your heart to be during spring break. What is God's claim on your life? What is God calling you to do? Sometimes we think of faith as being just someone there to call out for help when we need someone. And God is always there to be that person, to listen to you, to answer prayer, to help walk you through the tough times in life. But faith is more than Sometimes we think of faith as just somebody up there to forgive us when we haven't done the right thing. And God does that. God's a God of grace and God is always there for that. Sometimes maybe we see it as just the 
fulfillment of religious expectations. We're expecting to go to church. That's what we do. That's where we're supposed to be. But I think faith is more than that. It's God's claim in our lives. But it's greater than trying to fulfill religious expectations or someone to turn to when we're in trouble or someone to forgive our sins to fulfill God's purpose for our lives and fulfill that call that God has put to each and every one of our hearts. Sometimes we don't get it right. And the thing I like about this story is that we find Mary and Joseph, these holy parents who have had this amazing experience of raising the holy child, the Savior, the Messiah, who have sacrificed so much we Mary, this unwed mother, when the angel Gabriel says, you're going to give birth to this child, and he's going to be great, she says, here I am, God, I'll do it. And Joseph, when the angel comes to him and says, Joseph, I want you to take this woman, Mary, as your wife, even though she's pregnant, know that it's a child from the Holy Spirit, Joseph steps up and says, yes, I'll do it and I'll be the father of this child. And when the child is at risk, they flee to Egypt in order to save the Savior's life. And then they come back and Joseph lives in exile and they live in poverty, all to answer God's call in their lives. And yet, when this child stays back in Jerusalem instead of coming with the family, they say, why have you done this? They still don't get it, right? Even though they've had this intense experience of this child in their lives, they still don't understand what it's all about all the time. And Mary says, I'm going to take this and I'm going to treasure it in my heart forever. Even though she doesn't understand what's going on, she doesn't get the experience. She'll treasure it and keep it in her heart so that in that time when it somehow comes together and makes sense, She'll have it there, and she'll be able to respond. Sometimes we think we need to get it all right all the time. And sometimes we think we have to make the right choice all the time, and it's so difficult when there's these gray areas where both of the answers seem to be a noble and good thing, a, a path that God would want us to take. I think we can look at the story of Mary and Joseph, even in their position, not knowing what it's all about and what the right choice is. But trusting in the fact that God has a journey for them. And in every choice, just taking to heart that God is there and that God is with you and that God is following you through it all. Keep journey. Bill was really like stressing that you have some kind of spy thing and that I needed to work this in this time. <laughs> so this is it. Mission impossible. This is your mission if you choose to take it. <laughs> so you can tell if I worked it in. <laughs> Keep journeying. And when faced with what to do, we might not always know the answer. We might not always make the right choice. But the one thing that we can do is to continue to learn to continue to search out God's purpose in our lives. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just give you thanksgiving for these gathered here who tonight made the choice between many, many other options, I am sure, to come and to worship you and to take this time to, to be connected with to journey with you and to hear your call in their lives and help to understand better where you are leading them, especially in those areas where it is gray, when two options seem noble, when it's not easy to decide what is right and what is wrong or where you want them to go. And I just pray, Lord, tonight for each and every one that you might set on their hearts where you want them to go. The journey that you have for them, the ways in which you're calling them into ministry, the ways in which you are
are working in their lives each and every day. Help them to know. Help them to guide in their path. Help them to take the mission of the journey. Help them to know that even if the choice is the wrong choice, that you work through all